So, uh, I want to spend a few minutes uh, on testing for 3 NF. I am going to go a bit fast over this portion given we have only half an hour. So, the first part is uh, that given a particular schema to check if it is in 3 NF is actually quite hard, it is shown to be NP hard. Um, for that matter, uh, checking if it is in BCNF is also hard, uh, that is also expensive. Uh, if you have done a decomposition, checking if the decomposition is in BCNF is hard. Um, the next step is the initial algorithms for 3 NF would actually do repeated decomposition. So, you would find a functional dependency which shows violation of 3 NF and then decompose. I say forget about NP hardness, it is not a big deal and come up with some schema. The big problem is that this resultant schema could be this one, uh, which is AB. Um, uh, so, if you have A determines B, um, sorry, what is the original set of dependencies? Yeah. Uh, so, we had uh, A determines B and B determines C. This is the given set. If you decompose ABC using this one, you get ABAC. And that is in 3 NF, but it is not uh, dependency preserving. So, that is not of much use. So, uh, this whole field was this sub area was uh, kind of revolutionized by a very nice algorithm uh, from a researcher called Phil Bernstein, who is now in Microsoft research. Uh, but he came up with a really nice algorithm, which is called the 3 NF synthesis algorithm. So, they said, look all these people are going the other way, they are taking a relation decomposing, decomposing. Our goal is dependency preservation. Can I take the given set of functional dependencies and generate a schema out of those? Supposing I create one relation for every uh, functional dependency that I am given, you know, is that a good uh, relation? Is, is that a good set of relations? Is it in 3 NF? Is it lossless join? Those are the questions. So, uh, the answers are not obvious and what uh, Bernstein's algorithm did is it took the given set of functional dependencies, but then it did a little bit of cleaning upon it. It removed unnecessary parts, it minimized it in some sense and from this minimal set it creates a set of relations. And the minimal set is equivalent to the original set, right? It, the closure is the same. Therefore, uh, it is very easy to see that it is dependency preserving. And uh, it has also been shown that it is in 3 NF. The, to show that it is in 3 NF is harder, I would not even try. Um, and the nice part of the whole thing is that this algorithm is runs in polynomial time unlike all the other algorithms which are potentially NP hard. In some sense it does not matter, relational schemas have what 10, 15 attributes, 20 attributes. You know exponential time on 20, 2 power 20 is not such a big deal, million, you know we can live with it. Uh, but uh, still, it is nice to have a polynomial algorithm. So, how does this work? The first step is take the given set of functional dependencies and simplify it, remove unnecessary stuff. So, this is called the canonical cover. So, the idea is uh, if you were given a set of functional dependencies, earlier we did the closure which is inferring everything possible from it. Now, the idea is the other way, we want to make it smaller and smaller without losing any information, that is the basic idea. So, if you take this uh, set of three dependencies, A determines B, B determines C, A determines C. It is very clear we can delete this. If we delete it, we can still infer it from these two. Transitivity clearly gives us this one. So, let us delete it, we have made the set simpler. Okay, so, one uh, potential step is completely deleting uh, functional dependencies that are clearly unnecessary, they can be inferred. However, there are other partial redundancy problems. Uh, so, on this side, uh, next example, we have A determines B, B determines C, A determines C D. Now, A determines C D has as part of it A determines C, but we already saw that can be inferred from these two. So, we can actually delete C from the right hand side here and simplify it to A determines B, because I can always infer A determines C D from these three. Um, we can take A determines C D and split it into two. The decomposition rule lets us infer A determines C, A determines D and then we delete A determines C because as we saw it is redundant and we get this one. 
Okay, so that's uh, removing an attribute from the right hand side. And we have to ensure that we don't lose uh, any dependencies. In this case, it's clear. There is another interesting thing where, uh, take this case, it's very similar, except the right hand side, uh, the rightmost dependency is AC determines D. It turns out we can simplify it to this one, A determines D by deleting C from here. But this case is very tricky. Earlier, if I deleted something from the right hand side, I am potentially weakening it. Here, deleting it from the left hand side is making a claim that this stronger one holds. And therefore, we can uh, drop the weaker one. If, if you have these two, if I had both of these, then I can say this is redundant because this stronger one holds. From this stronger one, I can use augmentation to add C on the left hand side. And I can add C on the right hand side and then use uh, decomposition to remove it. So I can easily infer AC goes to D from this. The question is, to go from here to here, can I infer A goes to D from these? And in fact, I can. Why? From these two, I can determine A determines C. So if I take A plus here on this, A plus includes D. A plus is actually B, C, D. It includes D. From this, I can determine A functionally determines D. So I can add that to the set. So I get four dependencies. These three plus A determines D. And then because this is uh, weaker, I can drop it. So this is what I lined up with. So the idea is conceptually, I derive a stronger one and then I drop one of the existing ones. But first I have to make sure I can derive the stronger one. So those are the steps in computing the canonical. Uh, so there's a bunch of stuff here about extraneous attributes um, and how to determine if something is extraneous. So the idea is I will drop extraneous attributes. So the test is based on attribute closure. Um, how do I do that? Uh, take a dependency, alpha determines beta, and take an attribute A in the side alpha. I want to see if it's extraneous. So we can infer that it's extraneous if um, we can, uh, dropping it from the left hand side is actually strengthening. So what I want to see is if F logically implies uh, this stronger one, alpha minus A determines beta. This was our example. If you go back here, A is actually maps to C actually. So I want to see if, if I delete C, what is left is A goes to D. Can I infer it? And that is what I am checking here. Uh, so I want to check if F implies this one. The one on the right, extraneity on the right hand side is simpler. What we have to check is that after removing this one and adding back the weaker one, does it still logically imply the original set? So those are the two things. Um, in any case, we have to ensure equivalence. The new set of functional dependencies has to be equivalent in the sense that the closure is the same in both cases. So uh, the opposite direction is easy, so we only have to check the one direction. Now at this point, I'm sure many people are totally lost. I, if you are, it's okay. This stuff is a uh, little non-trivial. So it's okay if you don't understand it fully from here on. But please try to understand whatever parts you can. And then go back and read it and uh, get a better understanding of the overall picture. So let's do this by example. Um, we have A determines C, A, B determines C. Now B is extraneous in this side because I can infer uh, from, from these two, I can infer A goes to C. It's, in fact, it's trivial because it's already there in A goes to C. A goes to C is already here. Therefore, I can delete B from here. Now I get a set which has two copies of A determine C. I drop the second copy and just keep one thing. So I minimize this by keeping only one thing here. Now here is another case. In this case, my claim is that C is extraneous on the right hand side. Why? Because if I drop it from here, it's okay. I can easily infer A determine C. So if I take A, B plus, uh, from this I will get C. And 
what do I get after dropping C is A B determines D, uh, which I can from those two, if I compute A B plus it includes C D. C comes from here and D comes from what I have retained here. So, I can easily see that C is extraneous and I can drop it. So, what do I get? A determines C, A B determines D. So, the point of all this is to um, clean up the set of functional dependencies to remove unnecessary stuff. Now, this slide I am not going to cover in detail, uh, but what it is doing is giving you a very simple algorithmic way, which is also very efficient, it is polynomial time to check for extraneity. So, whatever intuition I gave you in the previous thing is formalized here using attribute closure. And we just use attribute closure on uh, individual uh, set of things. Okay. Mm, so, we take each dependency in F, we take an attribute in that dependency and check if it is extraneous. And there are two very simple checks shown here using attribute closure. Uh, I will not go into all the details, but please read it afterwards. And the checks will tell us if it is extraneous. If so, we delete it. So, now uh, finally, a canonical cover is a set of dependencies such that it is equivalent to the original dependency. The canonical cover, a canonical cover F c for a given set of dependency F is a set which is logically equivalent. That is F implies everything in F c, F c implies everything in F. It has to be equivalent. That is our goal. Furthermore, no functional dependency contains any extraneous attribute. That is also important. Um, that can if any extraneous attribute can cause redundancy in our schema. And finally, each left hand side of a functional dependency is unique. In other words, if I have two things with the same LHS, I should merge them. So, to compute this canonical cover uh, is actually fairly easy. Um, we we'll just do this repeatedly. Anytime I have two functional dependencies whose left hand sides are the same, I use the union rule to merge them. So, if I have alpha det 1 determines beta 1, alpha 1 determines beta 2, I merge it to get alpha 1 determines beta 1 beta 2. The next step is, if I find any extraneous attribute in any functional dependency in the current set, I will delete the extraneous attribute and um, keep repeating this until f does not change anymore. Okay. So, that is it. It is a very simple uh, thing for computing the canonical cover. Uh, and in the interest of time, I am uh, probably not going to do this. I want to have time for some questions. But there is an example here of computing the canonical cover by checking for extraneity. And now, the final 3NF decomposition, uh, it is we call it decomposition, but actually it is also called a 3NF synthesis algorithm synthesize a set of relations without going through a decomposition process as you will see. So, the first step is compute a canonical cover as we just saw. Then we do the following. We just step through each functional dependency in the canonical cover and if uh, initially we have uh, no ri. Now, we will go through this and right now there is no ri so far. So, this step this if will not be uh, violated. And so, we add the very first one as a schema. So, if you have a functional dependency alpha goes to beta and F c, we add it as a schema. In fact, another way to think about it is for every functional dependency in F c of you know it, it must be of the form something determines something. We create a relation alpha beta of this form. Now, there is a thing for re re removing redundant schemas and the idea is that some things may be contained in others. Uh, if you come back to our example, let me come to the uh, whiteboard here. So, if I had j, k, l is the schema and two things, um, j, k determines l, l determines k. In this case, what is the canonical cover? It turns out there is nothing uh, extraneous here, none of the attributes is extraneous and the canonical cover is this itself this is the canonical cover. So, the set of relations I would create from this would be j k l and l k. I would create these two. Now, the redundancy removal step does the following. 
it says but LK is already contained in JKL. So, I will not store it unnecessarily, I will drop this and keep just JKL. Okay, so, coming back to the slide here, uh, that is what both this step and this step do. They delete things which are contained in others. Uh, so, this one says that if none of the schemas contains it, add it. In other words, if it is contained, do not add it. And this says if it was added earlier, delete it. So, we will remove redundant schemas. And there is one extra step in uh, 3NF synthesis, which is if none of the schemas RJ contains a candidate key, create one extra relation which contains exactly one of the candidate keys for R. Can be any of the candidate keys, it does not matter which one, but this step is important. If you do not do this, uh, your join will not even give you back the original relation, it may miss some attributes, it may have duplicates and so it may be lossy in general. Um, so, this last step to introduce a, canonic, uh, a candidate key completes the algorithm. The intuition is very simple. I start with the given dependencies, I clean them up, remove unnecessary stuff, then I create a schema out of that, remove redundant relations from this and I add a canonical uh, uh, sorry a candidate key back if none of the relations so far contains a candidate key. If one of them already contains a candidate key, this step is skipped. So, that is it. So, the basic idea is very simple, the details are a little confusing, uh, but what do we get out of all this? Uh, every relation which we generate thus is in 3 NF, it is dependency preserving and it is lossless join. All this can be shown, it is not too hard to show all of these. Uh, I think we have it either in the book or in the supplementary material on the web. Uh, all of these are shown for the 3 NF algorithm. So, there is another example with this. Mm, this one had customer ID, branch name, employee ID, type, and so on. For lack of time, I will not go into this example. So, what we have done so far is BCNF and 3 NF. Now, how do they compare? It is always possible to decompose a relation into 3 NF, which is in a dependency preserving way. It is always possible to uh, break it into BCNF in a lossless join way, but not necessarily dependency preserving. So, what should we do? Um, so, anyway given uh, what SQL does, um, maybe 3 NF is not necessarily a desirable goal, uh, BCNF may be fine. So, anyway there are certain functional dependencies which you cannot enforce using SQL. So, doing it in 3 NF is not actually good enough, you cannot enforce it because SQL does not uh, support uh, any functional dependencies other than super key. So, the only thing in 3 NF is, is that there may be some uh, functional dependencies there which are not uh, super key and that anyway cannot be checked by um, SQL. So, why bother? Just go with BCNF. That could be one option, but it is kind of up to the designer. So, I want to take a short break uh, here and take some questions and then I will wrap up with multi value dependencies and a few other topics. Ramakrishna Institute Coimbatore, do you have a question? Uh, how to find the candidate key for a very large database? Is there any algorithm, sir? Again, uh, by very large database, if you mean uh, you know it has a lot of data that is irrelevant, the candidate key definition is based on. Uh, constraints in particular functional dependencies which you need to figure out from the application not from the actual data. This is something which should be true in the real world. So, if you oh, in the real world uh, you want a person to have only one department that is a functional dependency. Uh, you cannot infer this from the data per se except uh, there are data mining algorithms which say uh, you know maybe if by looking at uh, real data I can infer something but that is on maybe only a first step. After that we have to make sure that the real world will actually respect that and this is not based on actual data, this is based on the rules of the world. If your uh, college has a rule that a uh, person should be in only one department, there is a functional dependency. If that rule changes, there is a problem and if that rule changes and your whole database schema design changes because of that, we have a deep problem. So, sometimes we may even let some things pass 
if we are not sure that it will always be true. So, for th this particular thing right, uh, instructor department, uh, maybe we are not sure that an instructor has a single department. Uh, tomorrow that rule may change, in which case uh, we will say that the department is determined by the instructor, but it may not be uniquely determined. And this leads to a notion of multi-valued dependencies, which is the next slide which I will come to. Uh, Mufa Kham Ja College, Hyderabad, if you have a question, please go ahead. Uh, can we explain the students only normalization without explaining the concepts of functional dependencies? Uh, the question is, can we explain the concepts of normalization without explaining functional dependencies? No. Normalization is based at the heart on functional dependencies. Then there are extensions. But without functional dependencies, uh, you absolutely cannot explain normalization. It is not possible. Uh, now, the thing is, uh, if you see functional dependency, there are some complex things like uh, canonical cover, right? That is a little complex and confusing. Now, we did not need that to in order to explain BCNF 3NF, that came later. Uh, similarly, uh, you know, algorithms for attribute closure and so on can come later. So, the way we organized it in the book is start with some very basic concepts of functional dependency, use it to explain the normal forms and then go into detail on how to do closure, how to compute normal forms efficiently and so on. So, uh, depending on your syllabus, you could stop at the first part to give people an idea of what is there or go into the second part, which will enable them to actually use these ideas and in, in the real world. Does that answer your question or uh, do you have a follow up question? Next question is uh, trivial, uh, trivial. Related to trivial initial slides, you have uh, given some example uh, with a simple table 1, 4, 7, 1, uh, 4, 1, 3, 7, some small table initially you have explained about trivial. Can you re-explain that concept, initial concept? It is actually a very simple concept. A trivial functional dependency is one whose right hand side is a subset of the left hand side. So, let me use the whiteboard and explain. So, functional dependency of the form, let us say A B determines A or for that matter A determines A or any other variant A B determines B, A B C determines B C. All of these are said to be trivial because they are going to hold regardless of uh, you know what is the goal of a functional dependency, it should put a constraint on the real world. When I say that um, department functionally determines budget, I am saying a department cannot have two different budgets. So, that is a constraint on the real world. But if you look at dependencies such as these ones, that is the trivial ones, trivial means like uh, you know very simply obvious and why are they obvious? Because if two tuples have the same value for A and B, of course, they will have the same value for A. I mean, I have already said they have the same value for A and on the right hand side, I am saying then they must have the same value for A. Of course, they will. There is no way to violate these functional dependencies. It is impossible to create a relation which violates any of these functional dependencies. Okay? So, these will always hold on any relation which has the appropriate attributes and therefore, these are called trivial dependencies. They do not uh, really tell you anything new. They will always hold. Sir, if sir, you have a follow up question, question, go ahead. The question is the logical schema that we obtain hmm. after a ER diagram hmm. are in which normal form? Okay, that is a good question. Is it in what normal form is it? Uh, so, first of all, um, as yeah, long as uh, you did ER modeling properly in the sense you did not uh, put a set of values and call it a single valued attribute, you called it a multi valued attribute and so forth it will definitely be in first normal form. The reduction to uh, relational tables will respect first normal form. Now, beyond this, does it respect 3NF, BCNF and so forth, uh, it is hard to say. What typically happens is um, with binary relationships and so forth, uh, you will not get into trouble. But occasionally, uh, you can have a ternary relationship which causes trouble. You can have a bad design which had a number of attributes which had functional dependencies amongst them and that can lead to uh, things which violate uh, 3NF or BCNF. 
Uh, otherwise, by and large, I would say that BCNF would be satisfied, um, but not. It's not guaranteed. We saw an example, right, with uh, the uh, department advisor uh, ternary relationship, which violated uh, BCNF. Um, did it preserve 3NF? Uh, I think in this case, 3NF was preserved, but uh, you would have a redundant tables in the sense the same information is present in two places. Uh, so there is redundancy across tables. Uh, let me. So this was the example: department advisor and then instructor department. S is student, I is instructor, D is department here. So if you uh, look on the left bottom, there is. So uh, department instructor was turned into a table um, here, this one. Okay, and department advisor was turned into another table there, and uh, this table uh, violated uh, BCNF. And if you uh, if you take the pair of tables, uh, there is redundancy amongst them. So you might say that it's in this case it the two tables satisfy three enough, but there is redundant redundancy across tables. So this is actually something which is not obvious. If you start with the ER diagram and come up with something, you can have redundancy. Um, if you remember, I had briefly mentioned a concept called aggregation in the ER modeling uh, domain. That was partly meant to uh, remove this issue. It does not do it fully, but if you uh, take this ternary relationship, instead of that, uh, what we could have done is instructor, this is actually not very meaningful for the current example, but at least in principle we could have turned this into an aggregate, uh, there is a student and the student is related to a particular instructor department pair. Okay? So this was supposed to uh, model uh, you know, this situation, but even this does not really help very much. The end result is the same set of tables come up, even if you avoid a ternary by uh, using aggregation and created binary relationships. The final result is this redundancy will could occur. So uh, we can't guarantee anything more, which is why uh, you say that even after doing ER modeling, take the set of tables, look for the functional dependencies that hold, and check if it is in BCNF. In this case, uh, you would realize that it violates BCNF, and maybe you would decompose it further, or you might say it satisfies 3NF uh, and keep it. Okay. Any follow-up questions? Those were good questions. If there's any uh, follow-up question, yes, sir. Sir, like uh, uh, one of the uses of class diagrams is to uh, model uh, logical schema. Then, is it uh, does it suffice to go for class diagrams, or is it necessary to go for ER diagrams as well? Okay, that's also a good question. Which should we go for? Should we go with UML class diagrams and forget about ER, or should we go with ER? So, for modeling uh, data. ER is uh, certainly richer than UML class diagram. UML class diagrams were really meant for modeling object oriented, uh, you know, uh, if you want to build an object oriented program, you model classes and stuff like that. Uh, the ER model is richer, it has things which uh, those things do not have. UML as a whole has many other things, but if your goal is to do a database design, uh, you should probably go with ER not directly with UML class diagram. Yeah, the next uh, few topics are, uh, the first one is multi-valued dependencies and this uh, you know, is shown by these two relations here. The first one records the children of an instructor. So we have a relation ID which is instructor ID and child name. The second one records the phone numbers of an instructor. In case the instructor has more than one phone, you would land up with a relation like this. Both of these could have been generated uh, from an ER diagram which had a multi-valued attribute. So this is fine, right? So we have got these. Now supposing for some reason we merge these two schemas into one schema, ID, child name, phone number. Now let us apply our functional dependency theory to this. Does ID functionally determine child name? It does not. An instructor can have two children. Does ID determine phone number? No. Uh, instructor can have uh, two phones. Does child name determine ID? No. I mean, two, uh, 
two instructors can have children with the same name. Uh, phone number determine uh, instructor, not necessary, they may share a phone. So, essentially there are no meaningful functional dependencies on this particular schema. With no functional dependencies, you know 3 nf and bcnf are trivially satisfied, there is no functional dependency other than trivial functional dependencies and if you look at the definition they are obviously satisfied. So, we will say great it is in bcnf, uh, so it is a good schema, but is it? It is not, if you see there is repetition. Um, you can have a, a instance like this uh, where uh, this phone number 1234 is repeated, uh, this phone number is repeated, uh, this child's name is repeated and so forth. So, you might say why uh, store it multiple times, let us keep David with this phone number and William with this other phone, uh, this phone number, let us delete these two middle tuples. Okay. Then David occurs once, William occurs once. 1, 2, 3, 4 occurs once, 4, 3, 2, 1 occurs once. But this is adding uh, you know uh, spurious information. What is the spurious information this is adding? This seems to say that David is related with this phone number 1, 2, 3, 4, while William is associated with this phone number 4, 3, 2, 1. That is wrong. David is uh, has no, I mean the child name has no connection with the phone number and if you want to uh, show that this there is no such connection, you should actually have these two tuples also, if you use this schema. This is a bad schema, the normal functional dependencies do not show that it is bad, so we need something more. And this is modeled by having what is called a multi valued dependency. So, we would say that uh, id, instructor id multi valued determines phone number and it also multi valued determines uh, child name. The intuition behind a multi value dependency is to say that, if I come back here, the connection between id and the phone number has nothing to do with the connection between the id and the rest of this attributes. Okay. The uh, id has a set of phone numbers and there is no further connection between the phone numbers and in this case the child name. So, it, uh, the phone number is not uniquely determined, but it is uh, its connection to id is independent of anything else. So, then we will say that id multi value determines phone number. Uh, similarly, we will say id multi value determines child name and using this new thing which is actually uh, uh, you know it is connected to functional dependency, but it is slightly different. Uh, so, taking into account functional dependencies and multi value dependencies, uh, we can generate a new normal form called 4nf, which is stronger than bcnf. Uh, you take all the functional dependencies, the BCNF condition should be satisfied and thanks to the multi value dependencies, uh, some extra condition should be satisfied and that gives us fourth normal form. In this particular case, uh, 4NF would force us to decompose this schema back into these two which we started with, here we artificially combine them. Uh, 4NF will say that no, this is bad, these multi value dependencies exist and uh, therefore, this schema is bad and so you should break it back into the uh, decompose it into these schemas. I do not have time to go into details, it is there in the book. Now, a couple of other things, the overall database design process, uh, I have already told you about universal relations, ER modeling and normalization. Uh, I am going to skip those slides because I have already discussed them in detail. Uh, there are a couple of other uh, design issues, uh, there are many ways of coming up with bad schemas. Functional dependencies is merely one of them. Uh, here is something which I have seen people do uh, more than once. Supposing I want to have, uh, I want to track what were the earnings of a company in each of many years. Okay, if I want to uh, choose whether to purchase stocks of that company, I need this kind of information. Now, here is a, a bad database designer who creates a number of relations, earnings 2004 with the schema company id earnings, earnings 2005 company id earnings, earnings 2006 and so on and so forth, one relation per year. Is this in BCNF? Yeah, it is a binary relation if you see, it is trivially in BCNF. Um, but is it a good idea such a schema? No, it is terrible. To add new information, you have to add a new relation, not just add extra tuples, you have to create a new relation. 
each year you have to keep adding a new relation. That's crazy. Uh, so that's bad. Uh, another uh, kind of crazy thing which I've seen people do is to say company year and then company ID and the first column is earnings in 2004, second column is earnings in 2005, third column is earnings in 2006 and so forth. Now each year you don't add a table but you have to keep adding a new column each year which is also crazy. So both of these are bad ideas. But it turns out this thing, it's not a good idea to store data this way. But it's actually a good idea to display this uh, data in this way and this is routinely done. If you see the uh, uh, you know, uh, advertisements that companies put out with their uh, summary of their annual uh, report, they have this. Uh, you know, they'll say earnings in this financial year, last year, year before last and so on. That is this kind of thing. So it's an example of what is called a cross tab uh, where attribute names become column, uh, sorry. Uh, values for one of the attributes, which is in this case year, the values for year become column names here. So the column name here has 2004, 2005 and so forth. So this is nice for analyzing data, it's not good for storage. And many spreadsheets allow you to create a view which looks like this. Uh, in fact, SQL Server has a SQL operation called pivot, which lets you create a table like this. Um, it's good for viewing, not for storing. Uh, this next slide talks of redundancy across relations. I think I've already uh, explained this in detail using the whiteboard. Uh, the next slide talks of denormalization for performance. And many people have been asking this question. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll just skip this slide. And the last topic which I want to cover is modeling temporal data. I have been hinting at this. Um, and I just want to say a little bit about temporal data. I just have two slides here. So a, a temporal data is basically something which is valid at a point in time or for some interval of time. So uh, let's say that uh, you can say I'm a professor in IIT. Now if you take the designation, when I joined IIT, I was not a professor. I got promoted after some time. So if you say, uh, if you have an employee record with a, a designation, the designation Sudarshan is a professor was valid from uh, say 2003. Before that it was not valid. When I retire it will again be no longer valid. So this kind of uh, record could have a valid time associated with it. Now a snapshot is the value of the data at a particular point in time. So I may keep track of the fact that Sudarshan was a STEM professor in these years associate in these years, professor in these years. But if you take a particular point in time, only one of these will be valid normally. I would be only one of these three. I won't be two of them simultaneously. So how do you deal with all of this in the database design process? So one uh, way is to start with the ER model and add time somehow. Um, so there have been proposals, but no accepted standard for it. Uh, in the uh, context of uh, functional dependencies, there has been a little bit more uh, standardized work. And if you take this very simple thing, right? ID, this is, this is for instructor, um, ID, there is an address, a street and a city, two parts of the address. Now at a time, the institute may say, you can only give me one address, don't give me two addresses. You may maintain two homes, but tell me one place which is what I want to use as your address. But over time, this can change. So what we will say is that ID functionally determines street city does not hold across time, but it does hold at a point in time. And we will denote it using this symbol here. I'll say x, this t on uh, tau, there's a Greek tau letter tau for t on top of the arrow, says that this functional dependency holds at a point in time. That is, in any snapshot, this functional dependency will hold. But across time, it may not hold. The same x may be associated with different y values across time. Okay, so there is some uh, design theory based on that. I'm not getting into the details. Uh, but let's just look at the practical aspects of how to deal with it. So one uh, thing which many designers do is they will ignore time, go do the whole design with ER modeling, whatever, come up with tables. So uh, coming back here, uh, what we do is, given the fact that uh, you know, let's take this example of course. This is a little easier to understand. 
course has an ID and a title, and we'll say that course ID is a, a key for this thing. It can only have one title. But the fact of life is that over time, the same course ID is used for different courses with different names. Sometimes the name is evolved, sometimes a completely different course. So I'm going to replace this relation by course ID, course title, start end. So start is the start time when it, uh, some fact holds, end is the time when it ends. Now I can say that course ID is a temporal primary key if at no point in time are there uh, two tuples with the same course ID. So what that means is uh, if I have, uh, you know, the, the start end times do not overlap. So at any point in time I will have only one tuple with a particular course ID. Now how do you enforce such a constraint? Uh, there is a lot of proposals from long ago, 20 years back people proposed extending SQL to add temporal constructs. There were some standards proposed, but nobody implemented it back then. Somehow people ignored it, even though it is a real practical problem. It, it, I mean, if you take this particular thing, we have a problem in IIT, we had a problem in IIT, where we uh, kept the student grades with course ID, and whenever a student wanted a transcript, we would join the um, takes relation with the course relation and generate a transcript with course titles. Ah, but there was a problem. After some time, the uh, course ID is renamed. So if an old student comes back and says, uh, you know, please give me a transcript, I will generate a transcript with a completely different course name which has nothing to do with what the student took in the first place. This is a big mess. Okay? It, it, it is a serious problem. It is a real problem. So what we ended up doing is we denormalized. What we do is we create transcripts and store it. It will never change. It does not depend on the active database. It a separate version which will never change. So we do denormalization to deal with historical data. For current data, we store normalized things. Uh, but if a database had supported temporal constraints, we could have avoided this and just had one instance of the schema. So uh, there are other issues, foreign key constraints. Should it refer to the current time? Should it refer to some other point in time? You know, there are issues there. So we'll. Uh, I just want to highlight that temporal issues are important and with that I will uh, close this section.